All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Pepperstone Learn It Live event here over on YouTube. I hope you're looking forward to today's session because Tyron and I will be going through the basics into the intermediate, into the advanced kind of concepts of, of course, Fibonacci retracement indicator. How do we maximize profits with precision? So Tyron, I'm always interested in Fib. I love Fibonacci. I think it's one of the best indicators in the markets. Uh, what are your feelings about it before we get started? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, you look, yeah, Fibonacci is really, really cool. But I think understanding it and knowing how it really works with the rest of the market and the other indicators you can use with it is probably the key. I think a lot of people make the mistake of using it incorrectly. So when used correctly, absolutely, Fibonacci yeah, rules the world in so many different aspects. So yeah, trading is certainly no different. So you're looking forward to getting into tonight's content. They built the pyramids with Fibonacci. Today. They did. I think they built the so, human so, body. So I think I, I think I think our uh, our information in here when we say who who invented it and who found it might be incorrect. But anyway, we'll get through that very soon. Let's I'm give sure a big... that um, yeah, one of your men are going to come up regardless. I'm sure they're going to get credit for Fibonacci. Uh, is it going to yeah, be Drucken Miller or is it going? To be... <laughs> it could be Drucken Miller. It could be Wyckoff. We'll have to find out. Chat people can uh, figure it out before we go into it. Uh, let's give a big shout out to some people joining us here live. We've got Roman. We've got Ken. We've got Christopher. Michael Diamond Eye. Whimsy, the reluctant Jordanite, Pablo Marin, and Aussie Cobber 71. Great to have uh, you all joining us. So, without further ado, let's just run a quick disclaimer and we'll see you here back on the other side with, of course, uh, the beginning of today's session. All right. Well, let's get into it, Tyron. So, Look, Fibonacci, as we've talked about many, many times before, is one of our favorite indicators. It's probably, I would say, in my top five list uh, for sure. And I would say it's in your top five list as well. Uh, basically, what we're going to be going through today is three really big learning curves. And then we'll be discussing live markets as well to talk about some of the ways that you could have used it recently and also some of the ways that we can apply it to these markets. So we'll learn to effectively apply Fibonacci retracement indicators in day trading, identify those retracement levels and predict potentially price reversals. And of course, why that can give us precision points. We'll be get, talking about how we can maybe use Fibonacci a little bit more effectively with other tools to build confluence. And then, of course, we'll also talk about why risk management with Fibonacci can be so good as well, uh, which can help eliminate potential losses. Maybe the 75, 78, 6 Fib might be making a little bit of a, um, I guess, a, a little bit of a event here Ty, because we, we, we yeah. talk about, yeah, resurgence, I'd say. Yeah, that'd be fair. All right, so let's go through Fib. Fibonacci numbers, this is for the beginner section. Remember, we will be going to the charts later, so make sure to stick around. But Fibonacci numbers were first discovered <clears throat> by the Egyptians, no, in the 12th century by an Italian mathematician named Leonardo Fibonacci. And basically, Fibonacci numbers can best be described as a sequence of numbers where each successive number is the sum of the two previous numbers. Um, so let's have a look at the example here. We've got it on the next page. And basically, Ty, do you want to go through this quickly? Yeah, look, the... First things first, the golden ratio that a lot of people um, hear about is the 1.618. We will go into that a little bit more uh, later. But really, what the Fibonacci numbers are is an exponential set of numbers that effectively just add on top of each other. So as you can see here, the first Fibonacci number is 1. Then we've got 2 because 1 plus 1. Then, of course, 1 plus 2. So it's basically plusing the previous number every time. Uh, so that's when you got the 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. It just continues on uh, effectively yeah, infinitely, okay? So that's what Fibonacci numbers are, and that's how they are calculated. But the golden ratio is the 1.618. And what that means is the 1.618 is effectively the calculation of that the number times the previous number. That's what effectively the 1.618 is. So, And if you do that over you know, an exponential amount of numbers, you're going to get a very, very close number to 1.618 as your calculation. Amazing, but true. So that, that's how mm. that number is generated. Yeah, a lot of people really don't know that, I think, about the sequence numbers. And they just go, mm. oh, Fib, okay, that's a thing. But actually, it, it, it really is this 1618. And that's why they yep. call it the golden uh, Fib. And if you actually get a garden number tie and you go around, you get what we call a golden pocket. So the golden pocket is usually the, let's say, the uh, 0.618 Fib retracement to the 0.66. And that's what they call the golden pocket, basically the area in there. Highly regarded as one of the best turning points in markets, especially on the shorter timeframes. So let's talk about this concept of using Fibonacci numbers, Ty. From a beginner's perspective, how do we do it? Well, we'll talk about how to draw it in a second, but really Fibonacci and technical analysis 
should be considered potentially levels of support or resistance. And if a price often consolidates at these levels before potentially continuing in the original direction. So to visualize it, it might look something like this. It pulls back, it comes back to a level, consolidates a little bit or builds a position and then continues on. So it can be very good for swing traders as well, can't it, Ty? Yeah, most definitely. Look, I think that um, in terms of how Fibonacci works, you can actually use it in any time frame and in any tra trading style, whether it's actually scalping or even mm -hmm. long-term investing. You can find very, very strong Fibonacci levels even on monthly charts, believe it or not. So the levels yeah. are actually there, but I think it's important. Look, it, it's a little bit subjective in the sense, and I think we will talk about this tonight, especially when we go to the live markets. It can be very subjective as to where you can draw your Fibonacci line, right? Like there's no question about that. A right. little bit like a trend line, you can you can draw Fibonacci's everywhere if you if you try hard enough. But do they really make sense, and um, are they actually being drawn correctly? Because at the end of the day, if you draw a Fibonacci, um, say extension or retracement, and you're the only one that's seeing it, uh, it's not going to be very powerful, is it, Tom? Um, you no. need to be drawing the Fibonacci retracements that actually everybody can see, and uh, it's a very very important thing about what we're going to talk about tonight to make sure that when you do see one, you are actually addressing the correct levels. Yeah. So when we're drawing fibs, a lot of people ask me this question. They say, well, how do I draw a fib? I have seen incorrectly drawn Fibonacci, probably one of the most incorrectly drawn indicators it, out there. Ty. It is so common, so <laughs> common. Yeah. It's yeah. What we always want to do when we're talking about drawing retracement levels anyway with fibs, and fibs can be used two ways. We're going to be talking about retracement mostly today, but they can also be used as an extension. And you can also use... Uh, you know, kind of fib length extension ones as well. Uh, but basically the way we want to do it is we want to draw from the previous swing low or the trough level, usually to the wick is the way we do it. So we go from the wick all the way to the swing high and the wick there. And then that draws out, you can see this. And what I like to do is I like to pull the indicator to the left-hand side. So I basically go pull and I actually pull it sometimes just like this so that I get much more refined lines. And of course, this acts, all, all of these lines could potentially act as bounce points as we're coming down. So of course, 61.8 is the golden one. That's the, the one that most people look for. There's another one that I'll add a little bit later on, which will be the 75 uh, and the 78.6, because I think they are very, very good for stop loss levels. Let's just say that they are often uh, behind a 78.6 is often protecting you from stop loss hunts, which I think is a great little tip that you can sometimes use when you want to be in a scalping market or you want to be a little bit tighter and you don't have an obvious place to put it. Fib can help you with that. But you've got to remember that each one of these points basically also is just really psychologically pulled back through the zone. Now, why can a 61.8 be so good? Well, when we think about it, if a market is going down to a 23.6, that's basically 23.6% retracement of this move. Then it goes 38.2%. 50%, well, that sounds like a bargain. But as it goes past 50%, people start to lose faith in that trade as well. So often the 61.8 or the 75, that's actually where it, you really have to have absolute confidence that the trend is actually intact and other reasons behind it because often this is where it, it does turn, but what it's doing is it's pushing you to your absolute psychological limits. And Ty probably knows what about it's about to occur on these charts. But of course, when we're talking about psychological limits, we're going to talk about uh, a certain person that, that told us to study force type. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Anyone I think it's, yeah. yeah. Anyone have a guess on that? Anyone want to have a guess in the community about who Tom's going to... Somehow yeah. he manages to bring him in, even if we're oh, talking it, about Leonardo time. Fibonacci. Uh, but, every time. <laughs> <laughs> so look, it's very, very important to remember that these are percentage moves, okay? So quite often um, when Tom and I are, are doing our streams and our videos, you'll notice that we can talk about a fib when we're actually not even drawing the fib. And that's because we've done mm. it so long that we know that we know that it's a 50% fib or a 61.8% fib or thereabouts because all it is essentially is a, is a percentage pullback of the move that we're looking at. So, you know, when you get good at trading and you've seen enough markets and seen enough charts, you don't even have to draw the fib line to be truthful because all it is, uh, you can start imagining where that marker is uh, and and really you know that it's a 50% fib you know it's a 50% pullback of that move 
Uh, so there's no magic to the science that if, if you do hear Thomas and I talking about the level like, oh my God, how do they even know that? It's only because it's mm. a percentage of that move, okay? So to keep it in really, really simple terms, they're not magic numbers. They're just percentages of that move. Now, it does stand to reason that a lot of people talk about a trending market being a two steps forward, one step back approach, right? So it stands to reason that a, a 38% pullback uh, plays very well with that. You've got a um, a 60% move, a 20% pullback, a 100% move, 30% pullback. So it's two steps forward, one step back. It's a very, very even trend. And when you do see a really, really healthy uptrend or a healthy downtrend in action, a lot of the pullbacks will be really, really smooth like that. And you'll see them go down to the 38% uh, percent or even the 50% at a bit of a stretch. But what you've got to be mindful of, yeah, you, know, you hear Tom talking about the uh, the bargain levels where, you know, realistically, that's where the um, yeah, a lot of the bigger people are hanging out. Okay, you've got to look at it like a 38% uh, percent pullback might be Woolworths, a 50% pullback might be Costco, but you're absolutely in the flea market at 61.8. And that's where the bargains can actually quite happen. And I think that's what Tom is referring to. When they're down there, you have to have faith in what you're buying, even though the vendor might be a little bit dodgy. Yeah, I find they also work really well on short time frames as well. So specifically yeah. when you get a lot of turning, the the way that liquidity is built, which we'll go through a little bit later, you can kind of start to get an idea of why 61.8s might be and 75s are pretty good when it comes to getting turns and that's to build the biggest position as fast as possible for anyone that's done our day trading masterclass that's something we talk about a lot it's called the first time frame change of trend it's very important to be able to start to think of markets more as not so much um are you trading an indicator but really what's the storyline you know i say this a lot you know to read the markets or to get better You've got to kind of go with, I think it's like a Wayne Gretzky quote tie. Actually, I might be able to bring it up here. Uh, let's have a look here. NHL quote, I think. Something like this. Uh, puck, the puck quote. Uh, anyway, I'll just kind of, I don't know exactly what it is here. Here we go. Good hockey player plays where the, pu where, um, the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. Okay. And that's the quote. And I love that one because I, I wanted like to get the one. right quote out there. Yeah. Because what they're really doing is they're starting to see where the market is more likely trapping or doing something. And you'll notice on our charts, we always have the idea of patience, react, don't predict. And what that's really telling you to do is it's saying, well, this game is this, this, this trading thing or investing or anything. It's not easy. Of course, life is not that easy. Everything requires work. But what we need to be starting to do is we need to start to be able to react to when the market has shown us that it's willing to do something or it's trapped in money or something like that. And when you start to think of it that way, you'll actually have a lot more success. And I'd like to put it to the community here, to the chat. Have you started to think of markets more as what is the, the evidence that we have so far and how can we use that to potentially interpret the markets a bit better rather than just saying, oh, well, the stochastic's over this amount, I'm going to cross it. Because you got to remember, if you're yep. using a stochastic or an RSI tie or any of these other indicators, even a FIB, by themselves, are they any good? Yeah. They're okay. No. They're, they're okay, okay but good, not, they? not great. They're not great. Hmm. And and realistically, you know, when you start to understand the market as a machine that you have to work with rather than control, your trading mm -hmm. is going to improve infinitely. Oh, here he is. Here he is. It was always going to happen. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> well there's a reason there's a reason and, and look i think the thing is what you're probably trying to get through here is we bring in new indicators into this channel all the time obviously discuss new concepts and bring them together but what you need to do is you can't use anything in isolation so of course wyckoff richard uh he taught us <laughs> that basically we need to of course study force and the reason we need to be so important on this concept is because we need to have remember the courage to go with that side and fibonacci is the courage let me just say that remember 61 8 and 75 the courage so of course what wyckoff said and this helps us to better interpret the market is let's just consider the market is the composite man that was basically it is a full-on device to kind of you know aggravate us to push us to our very limits psychologically and to often test us and therefore because it does all of these things we have to be on the lookout for when it might have got us. Um, now, what I like to think of, Ty, is when I first got into this game, when I first got into you know trading, investing, all these types of things, what would I have traditionally done? You'd then have traded have a, a, look, a tick chart. <laughs> well, yeah, I might, might have done that. But I would have probably traded a bunch of uh, you know moving averages with a stochastic, 100%. with an RSI, 100%. with a MACD, and done divergence and done all these things by themselves. Yeah. So if you're seeing those types of things happen, and then all of a sudden... 
the stop loss gets run, like a hunt gets run, and then it reverses off in the direction that you thought it should have been going for. And you're sitting on the sidelines at this point. You could, you might be able to say, ah, I know what they've done. And if you watch some of our previous webinars, specifically one of the ones we did on daily steals, uh, that, that can be a very, very powerful technique. And we can actually use Fibonacci's to get involved in some of those. Hint, hint. Uh, that's definitely a little bit of an extra thing you could do there. So how do large traders actually enter positions? Remember, if we're a scalper or day trader, we still need to understand this. As a market comes down, they will buy positions and they'll have basically three positions. We always remember this. They have a premium, they have some kind of fair value, and they have cheap. And in general, it'll the market will manipulate price around to build a position. Now, once we see one of these areas, we can basically say, okay, well, we know what that is once it breaks out to one side. It'll either be a period of accumulation or it'll be a period of distribution or as many people call it, a demand or a supply. And of course, demand or supply can be used very, very well along with support and resistance tone with these Fibonacci levels, can't they? So let's actually jump into yep. the chart here. This is something that it looks like. But we'll jump into the chart. And all I do have here is just, I've just got a fib. And this fib here is just a, uh, a drawn fib of 61.8s and 75s. And you can see that if I load over a different fib, this basically this is what I'm doing. I'm always drawing from the left-hand side. I'm drawing from the wick here. For any beginner, I'm drawing from the wick all the way down to the low. Now, you'll notice I don't draw it to here. So let's delete this one, make it a little bit simpler. What am I doing? I'm pulling it across. Now, why am I doing that? Because it still remains stable here, Ty. It's always, always, and that's why I do this, so that I can really easily read these fib numbers. Now, it's up to you which side you want them on. In trading view, you can select them. You can have them on the left. You can have them on the right. You can have different colors depending on your charts, lots of flexibility. But I like these ones. Uh, so 38.2, 50, I'm actually a bit iffy on. 61.8, 75, 78.6, they're some of my favorites. They're, they're what I would give uh, the best best chances on. Ty, what are your, what are your favorite fibs? My we favorite favorites. We all have our favorites. I, I really love, love the, um, the, the 38 and the 50. 38 is, and actually the, the least favorite of mine is actually the 23. And a lot of people really love the 23. Uh, but to me, sometimes that pullback uh, either in either direction is just a little bit too sharp. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, quite often they're the ones that if they're going to fail, they're, they're the ones that are going to fail. 38 to, I've, I love trend and I love following a, a nice high, 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 low sequence. And when the market is in beautiful movement, the 38 uh, is the king of the show. But, you know, again, the, the 50 and the 61.8 obviously have their their important place because they do tend to be the accumulation and distribution zones. Really, a 38.2 doesn't tend to be an accumulation or, support, or, or a supply zone or a demand zone because it's just really a parking point to a, a pullback. And that's quite often you'll see one candle there and continue on. That's what happens in a trend. Whereas the 50 and the 61.8, tend to have more consolidation in those zones. But of course, that makes the position stronger. Yeah, so let's have a look here at, at a couple of different, uh, we're just going to use Apple as a stock here, Ty. And I just want to show you that the FIB retracement, like you're saying. So you're, you're talking about this idea of kind of getting a series of higher peaks and higher troughs and higher peaks and higher troughs and higher peaks and higher troughs. And, higher troughs. and what actually happens here is you kind of sometimes get a sequence where you can use a FIB very basically. So you just draw from the left. Again, I'm just drawing from that low to the high. So a lot of people will draw it like this. My suggestion, pull it across so you can Take actually it see it properly. Take it out. Yeah. Uh, and what you'll notice in this one is this particular trend begins, this actual one likes to hog the 61.8 through every one of these retracements. So actually, as we draw this, you'll notice it's pretty much pulling back to that 61.8 once, twice, three times. And that kind of becomes that reoccurring trend here as we're picking it up. Plus we've got, of course, at that point, a peak, a trough, a higher peak, a higher trough, a higher peak, a higher trough, which we can also draw a trend line tie. So we're getting a trend line stacked on top of a Fibonacci. Now that's an incredibly basic technique, but if you're someone that trades, you know, CFD stocks with Pepperstone here, well, you might know
I think we may have lost Tom there. Uh, it looks like he's had a bit of a failure, guys. Hopefully, you can still hear me here at the moment. We'll let Tom uh, log back in. I wasn't sure if it was my side or if it, or if it was Tom, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tom is gone, and I think the chart is gone as well. So we'll give him a, a minute or two to, to get back because he's actually in control of the screen. Um, and I'll just quickly message him and let him know that... Um, <laughs> Okay, so hopefully he'll be able to uh, join us again without having to yeah reset his computer. A couple of gremlins have kicked in. But I think what we're probably trying to highlight here is that, uh, yeah, until the screen comes back on, the trend that we just saw on Apple is a very strong series of higher highs and higher lows. Now, you might look at it on face value and say, all right, this is what's what you're going to see. This is what, yeah, you know, in an uptrend, you're going to see a series of higher highs and higher lows. But if there isn't a moving average to help you and, and aid you, that's when you're going to have a few issues, uh, yeah, potentially getting and locking in the ideal location to actually rejoin the trend. That's going to be uh, the issue. So hopefully Tom's about to, to rejoin us, but he's coming back in. Here yeah. he is. He's back. Here he is. <laughs> yeah, that was unfortunate. Sorry, everybody. I, I did, MBN, MBN. Sorry for anyone. <laughs> if you're from, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, MBN. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. I was, I was just saying, Tom, that the the series of higher highs and high lows that we were talking about, mm. yeah, in conjunction with the trend line, in conjunction with a potential moving average, in conjunction with the Fibonacci's, mm -hmm. make an mm -hmm. extraordinarily strong case to actually join mm -hmm. that trend. Uh, yeah. And and realistically, when you do that, uh, you're putting the odds so much higher in your favor than actually just taking uh, a random pullback that you think might be going in that direction, because you're seeing Definitely. multiple forces in action to really get that momentum moving the force that we're talking about. Yeah. So you can add, you can pretty much, you'll find like a moving average and it'll be one of them, probably an EMA or something here. And there'll be a certain moving average, whether it's a 20 or 50, something like that. But if you start to stack those odds in your favor, as Tyron said, those three things, really you've got a very simple strategy that can follow trend. A FIB pullback with maybe a trend line that's stacked with the 61A. In this case, obviously hindsight, very, very easy to see, but that's a very consistent type of thing. And you can kind of start to stack it in your favor because you can say, well, okay, I've got a trend line. I can see we're making higher peaks, which is a big thing, isn't it, Ty, whenever you're doing yeah. this. You cannot make a lower peak before coming back to the trend no. line. That's, no. <laughs> so what you don't want is you don't want to, uh, let's say this had gone up and then it had stopped there and it had come back to the trend line and it had pulled back from that, a 61.8 fib. That would nowhere near be as no. strong as a momentum play like yeah. it was doing that is, which that is be wary be very very wary and that's how and and this is where people come unstuck they they get so stu um you know stuck in the belief that the pullback is the pullback to that zone is and they don't look at what the momentum has done in the market so a 61.8 is not going to be anywhere near as strong or a 50 or a 38.2 is mm. not going to be anywhere near as strong if a new high hasn't been made and a lower high has actually brought about that pullback it's extraordinarily important to remember that because a significant amount of market momentum has been lost at that point. Yeah, so so I think like in a basic Fibonacci world, if I was a beginner coming straight in, I would say add a 20, a 50, a 200 moving average to your chart, look for trend lines in directions of trends, and then see if you can see like a one, two, three kind of thing like that. Once you get that, then put a fib over the first one and often you'll get similar pullbacks through each one of those runs. And that also leads into something like an Elliott wave theory as well, Ty. That, uh, and of course, and when all these kind of concepts stack together, then there's generally a better confluence. So that better confluence all, like really helps us as traders to, to, of course, make better decisions at these points. Now, that's just a stock for an example, but let's go over back to, I guess, uh, gold here as an example, very, very similar time. What will often happen around a turn point in the markets is you'll often, you'll you'll kind of see like a, a kind of a topping effect, which could be like a high and a low and a higher high and then a lower low, which is one of my favorite topping effects, one of the first time frame changes of trend. And often when you get something like that, you'll actually draw a fib from again, the high. So we always draw from the left-hand side down to the right-hand side. So it would look like that, but I like to pull it so it makes it easier. And you can see how the market comes back to that 61.8 kind of area and then actually finds resistance. Now, at the beginning of trends, this is often the way it kind of works. Uh, when you're in a nice accelerated trend, like Tyron was mentioning before, generally speaking, like a nice big pull-up, like Apple had initially off the base here, 
these will often be 38.2 fibs. So if you actually pull a fib from the low here to the high, that's a 38.2 fib. Now that's more of a swing trade. So that's Tyrone's one of Tyrone's favorites right there, isn't it, Ty? Uh, usually okay. if you hit like some kind of moving average in here, let's say a 50, you hit the 38.2, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty strong. It is extraordinarily yeah. strong. It's a very swing type method. Mm. Absolutely. Fill, fill the gap as well. Come back into the range, which would be demand, which we'll talk about in a second. There's a lot to like about this particular fib. So remember, it's never about, as any beginner out there that's watching this right now, if you're enjoying the show, reminder as well, do, do thumb up the, uh, give us a thumbs <laughs> up for the video. Uh, but yeah, basically you're looking for confluence. Now, some of the confluences, those moving averages we discussed, then of course, trend lines if you get them the fib levels themselves again my tyron's favorites are 38250 mine would have to be 38261 and 75 so i'm big on those deepers deeper pullbacks well, let's just go back over to the slides for a second here and then we'll come back to the charts uh, because there's a little bit of information i want to talk about when it comes to stacking a second concept onto any fib we know we draw left to right we know we can do that pretty much through any swing which is just going to be literally when we see this, let's say we have that, or we'll just draw from the left to the right here and we'll be looking for certain pullbacks. Let's say this one here was a 38.2 fib and it comes down and it gives us a little turn. Well, what are we going to do? We're probably going to look to buy because that's the direction of trend. So fib retracements can also give you pullbacks in those in trends, which keeps you in the trend trade. But let's talk about one other thing that we've discussed here on the channel a lot, which is, supply and demands and accumulation distribution concepts so we probably all know when a market is range bound a lot of you will call it a channel some people will call it uh you know a, a wyckoff accumulation or a distribution uh, some people will call it demand as it breaks out or supply if it breaks down whatever we call it what we can all agree on is that a lot of orders have transacted here correct Ty? a lot of positions have traded in that zone because it's been yep. stuck for a while I like yeah. to think of it as effectively the market has hit equilibrium. So yep. when you have a range market, which are very easy to spot in the markets because they're just horizontal, literally trapped price, yep. we can kind of figure out that probably some positions were entered at that point. And then as it broke out, that meant that in this case, we had a lot of demand outstripping supply and price was rising up. Now, what happens if price comes back into this zone tie? Often there'll be potentially some buyers around there, correct? Yep. Might see some buyers in there. So Very if eager. we can, what's that? Eager, 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 eager beavers. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> so if we have that kind of thing going on in markets, we can potentially start to draw fibs as well into these levels. So for an example, let's go with this particular chart here and we'll just go with this high down to this low. If we drew a fib from here to here, we would obviously get a whole bunch of fib lines. Now I can I can basically eyeball this and I can tell you that's a 61.8 fib tie. It, it would be very likely 61.8 fib. Now what you might notice is that there is a little area in here on the smaller time frames that is most likely supply. And why do we know that? Because the market was range bound through this level, then it broke down and it broke down a damn serious way tie. So that means whoever sold here is what we call a drop and a base and a drop in, in supply demand world. Whoever sold there was very keen on the market uh, in terms of going down. So it probably helps you to think that if markets come back up to these levels in the future, and let's say there's a fib there as well, that it might be a strong level to find sellers. And that can help you, of course, as a day trader. Let's say you're looking at a two hour and a four hour and a daily kind of trends. And then you found these levels, these little supplies and stuff. And then it comes up into that zone during, let's say, London Open or New York Open. And you're suddenly on a five minute, a three minute, a 15 minute chart. It always pays to know what's on the higher time frame, doesn't it, Ty? Because the bigger oh, traders, they don't, they don't trade these small time frames usually. Yeah. The algorithm. Imagine uh, exactly, and imagine how many people would be, you know, sucked into believing that when that price does eventually touch that supply zone again that the market's actually going long like they're the people that are actually getting sucked in where they don't actually see the supply level being formed and mm. you might be led to believe that the market's going to go long from there and then all of a sudden bang uh your stop loss is going to get hit very very quickly because it's actually a supply zone and that's why it's important to understand this concept because it really stops you from trading in the wrong direction because in reality Eight times out of 10, this market's never going long at these touches. As soon as it touches that level, 
it's really continuing what we probably, after we've been trading for a while, know what is more than likely going to happen. But it probably, I think if you did a quiz, you'd be amazed at how many beginning traders who, who don't really understand the market would actually be going along the minute to touch that supply zone again. Yeah, a lot of people would be going long here because what they'd be looking at is they'd say, oh, it's a breakout. It's and all you, good. Everyone's breaking out. out. But yeah, we yeah. haven't taken out this supply yet. Yeah. So the problem is we took a high, sure, but you haven't taken mm -hmm. the supply. Now, if you took the supply, okay, well, then you move into the next supply like this one mm -hmm. did here. See how it stops here again? It takes the high, okay, whatever that's valid. But once it takes those highs, what's it done? It's taken stop losses and squeezes them out to the next level. So markets actually move from equilibrium to equilibrium point. Effectively, they move from these kind of range bound sections to the next area, to the next area, to the next area. And it's best for us as traders to recognize when a level is broken and therefore it's going to move to the next level and more importantly, where the orders are in the market. And that's what supply and demand theory really teaches us. Where are the orders? How do we potentially spot them? Fibonacci can be used along with this theory and along with support resistance and role reversal theory, another great one to use it with. I think I've got an example later on. And it can be used with so many different great technical reasons, kind of tie. It's not just that this yep. is the best way. It's just one of the ways that you can apply it. Yeah, most definitely. It's a, understanding all of the concepts together makes trading seem really easy. Now, it's not. Trading is not easy, Absolutely but really... Not. It, it, it's really hard, but when you understand it uh, and you put the concepts together, the market makes sense. And I think that's probably the important part. It's a little bit like, we say it all the time, you know, it's, it's no point having an indicator on your screen that you don't completely understand. Now, we, we have on our streams, we, we put MACD divergence and things like that on the charts to really help, uh, I guess, teach what we're trying to yeah, portray. But in reality, Thomas and I don't need a MACD indicator to know that there's MACD divergence. We just have to look at the moving averages. Why? Because we know what causes that divergence. So we know it's happening. We don't need an indicator to tell us. Very similar to the FIB. We don't need a FIB to tell us that the pullback is in the right place. So the tools are there to teach you and get you into the rhythm. But I can't express how important it is to understand the indicators that you are using, even if they're mainstream, even if they're popular and everybody's talking about them, understand why and how they work and it will put you ahead of the game. And that goes for every indicator, not, not just the Fibonacci retracement tool. Yeah, so here's just an example of a drop and a base tie and a drop. And we can already see this. Remember, we've had we could be patient. We could literally be reacting to this as it comes back up into this level. What could we do? Draw from a high to a low. We already know that information. You get a Fibonacci, and what you'll notice is that there are two key points. The first one is probably through here, which is where support becomes resistance. The second one is when it comes into the supply zone itself. And you're really seeing that kind of 61.8 probably. I would say that's 61.8 or a 75 just by eyeballing it. So these fibs get hit and it's your job to recognize this is a key zone. And what I like to do as a scalper or day trader is I like to actually figure that zone and then go small time frame and then look for my little turn points down in the lower time frames. Once I see a turn there, I can then say, well, I figured that out on a higher time frame. So what will that do? If I get into a good position, I could potentially hold it for longer. And again, um, we did it a few weeks ago where we talked about that day trade concept of the day steal highs. And that particular one with fibs can be very, very, very powerful around opens. So another thing that we tend to look for here when we're doing naked chart analysis to find these levels is we're looking for wicks. Wicks often also hold uh, orders or excitement of the markets. So if you have like giant wicks coming off a level, and then the market goes up and then it comes back down into that weak zone and you draw a fib from here to here and that turns out to be a 50 fib or a 61.8 or a 38.2 or whatever it is, then often there'll be buyers at those zones. So again, just a fib with some other tool, not in isolation, ever tie, always along with other things. And I think Absolutely. that's something that's really important. So yep. we need to recognize this type of thing and then we're drawing generally between these types of levels, the low swing to the high swing, the high swing to the low swing, we get fibs. Uh, and if you're in a pretty strong trend, you'll generally be getting 38 twos or 50s. And if you're in a more methodical, slower trend or a smaller time frame, you're generally getting 61 eights and 75s. Okay. So yeah, just, just depends on the type of market, the type of progression you're seeing it. 
I would go back to the slide where we showed Apple before. Uh, we saw a super, super bullish strength. Uh, when that pulls back, generally it will pull back more likely to the 38.2 fib, won't it tie? Because that's yep. going to show us, you know, if it had so much strength, yep. why would that's it come it. back to a 61.8 at that point? That's right. Exactly right. Trish um, asks the question, so do we check this on a one-year or a one-day chart? Trish, it's really, really important to keep your timeframes uh, in the context of what you're trying to achieve in your trade. So if you were trading a daily chart, it would no be, it'd be no point looking at a yearly chart. Um, you really want to be keeping it only a couple of timeframes uh, on either side. So if you were really doing your analysis on a daily, yes, you could definitely look at a weekly. And you can look at the four hour for the sharper movements or the eight hour, but you wouldn't be going out as far as a monthly or a yearly because it's not really going to do you any good. That information is just too far. Um, it, I guess it's just out of the parameters of what you're trying to achieve. So it's a bit like if you were trading a 15 minute chart, it's pointless opening a weekly chart. It's not going to, it's just not going to help you. Okay. But a daily, a daily will, because a daily will give you the, um, the, the valid trend for what you're trying to achieve. Okay. So you've got to try and keep them in, um, yeah, we like to keep them within two or three standard uh, timeframes of what we're trying to achieve. So uh, as an example, you know, if we're looking at uh, a daily chart, we definitely look at a weekly if we're doing our main analysis on the daily because every five days obviously is a one weekly candle, but we're not going to go and look at a monthly very often because yeah, we're going to require 30 candles to the one that we're analyzing. So it doesn't really give us as much significance for what we're trying to achieve. So here's an example of the pound US dollar recently. And, and what you'll notice is that there are certain periods where you can kind of see consolidation. Consolidation here, consolidation here, and it goes down. So this is kind of like dropping and then basing and then dropping and then basing. And as it goes down, what you might notice is that when it breaks that new low, it retraces. Now, that's pretty normal. Not often do trends just go boom, 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 boom. Of course, sometimes they do go parabolic each way, but mm. they generally retrace. So why we say patience react don't predict? Let's have a look here at this chart. So here we get kind of a market that's pretty bullish and there's the trend is no doubt up. You'll notice that often people will draw something like a trend line like that behind it. Valid, fair enough. We see it initially drop off. We might not know anything at that point. There are some reasons that you might be able to say this has changed trend, but let's just say we didn't. Then it breaches the trend line. Okay, fair enough. Then it rallies back up. Fair enough again. You can see this little miniature supply and it sells off and it starts to kind of consolidate. At that point, once we've seen this, we can probably guess that at least on this time frame, the trend is switching. The trend is changing to the downside. You've taken out this level as we've done here. So it's fair to say at that point that you might be able to then start drawing Fibonacci zones. And what you're really doing is you're trying to build together fibs with other reasonings. So as you go through this, what you might notice is that there is clearly a bunch of wicks that are coming through here. So we've got a weak rejection, a weak rejection, a weak rejection, a weak rejection that leads onto a massive sell. We know at that point the direction is, of course, selling or down. So what could we do, Ty? Well, we could withdraw a fib between these highs here, so this high swing, because this begins this whole trend down to the low swing, and we'll get a couple of fib levels. And you'll notice that I've got this 61,866. And what do we see appear around there? A candle, which is often known as a pin bar or shooting star, okay? Now, if you had that shooting star, then you added an extra confirmation to say, well, I know this could be a key level, all right, I've seen the reaction. I know it's come back to this level. I know it's pin barred. What extra confirmation could we use here? For me anyway, it would be a follow through. So I would like to see a follow through to a new low or actually a pullback to around a 61.8 fib. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to zoom this in enough at this point and get it correct. Let me actually mm. draw a visual on here. But I bet you that comes back to a 75 or a 61.8 tie on this one here. So let's go to a... Five minute chart, and this is not really a rehearsed level. I'm just kind of showing you how you might want to start stacking concepts. So here's the 61.8. At that point, we might not know anything. We might say, well, it's hit it, whatever. There's supply, sure, that's good and all. But then we've saw that shooting star. So remember on the higher time frame, it looks like this. So what we could do is we could draw between the high and the low because we'd seen that at that point. Remember, this is where that candle closes. And we could say, well, I want good risk reward. 
So what could I do as a day trader? Well, I could get a fib out. I could draw between that high and that low and, you know, look at that. This could become our extra little entry kind of point. Now, if we sold here with a stop loss above here, which we can kind of figure out uh, by using the tools that we've got in our hands. So let's do that. There's the ratio. Just even if we took it down to this point, you'd be looking at about a 1.5 to 1. Now, you might say, well, where did this market come from? Of course, there's extra things that you can add on to it. You might say, well, I think it can go back down to this block here being the last level of little miniature demand on this small time frame. So that's fair. All right, we might have done that. We enter the position. We set our take profit right there. And we basically just leave that on. Now it's a 4.6. Because we've used Fibonacci to get extremely good levels, remember all of this is actually spotting the evidence. So it's a very replicatable style of strategy. Then as it comes back up into this level, we can say, well, is this worth it? How many times are we going to win a trade like this? And you might say, well, I'm going to win it 50% of the time. And that might not sound very good, but if you're getting a four to one ratio trade tie, if you won that 50% of the time, would you be that sad? I would be very, very happy. Hmm. So yeah. <laughs> it's all about the ratio. Uh, look, yeah. You know, yeah. if you if you're doing fifty percent, um, you know, trades where you're trading one to ones all the time, you're never going to get anywhere, right? Like at, at the end of the day, you're going to be giving back as much as you're winning, and you're you're not going to lose, but you're not going to really win either. But when you're talking about trades that are going to give you four, five, six to one you can afford to get a lot of those wrong and and, um, and still be well in front. So it really comes down to the ratio and your expectation. But yeah, you've got to keep your expectations in check. We then just throw hmm. people, people make the mistake of actually saying, well, it needs to be a five to one trade to be, um, you know, valid. So I'm going to put my take profit down below that red line uh, that you've got there on the chart because that's what a five to one will be. But that's not how it works, right? Uh, no. You've got to find the, the, the location where, there's a really high probability that the chart that it's going to get there on that chart. And that's how you determine your, you don't make it up, right? You, you got to take what the market gives you, not what you want the market to do. It's very, very mm. important that we are a slave to the market, not the other way around. So I would call like the movement down to this point and stopping here is actually a question mark. I'd be like, why did it stop there? It doesn't make much sense to me based on this action. And I would be pretty steadfast that you should have gotten something like at least this demand or something down in here. And in this case, look, it obviously came back and then it went down. But if you'd broken even that trade, which basically just means, you know, setting your stop loss behind, uh, it would have it would have definitely worked. Now, it's just an example. I, I could see it just on the chart. So obviously, I knew it was probably going to set this kind of way. And it's an example of how you could start to use Fibonacci to just be better about getting entries. And again, if you're swing trading 50s, 38 twos, aggressive trends, they're really, really good. But if you're looking at how does a market build quick liquidity, I've got to say the golden pocket being 61, 8, 66 is one of the better areas. Hopefully that answers Avery Winter's question as well and says here, would FIB show up on a five minute or one hour chart or it applies to all time frames? It's all time frames, and I hope this is this has answered it. So have has it answered it, Avery? If you're still with us, let me know uh, in the in the chat. Absolutely applies to all uh, time frames because the fib mm. is just a, a level of movement, and that movement yeah. can be measured in any time frame. Yeah. So here's just an example of the US dollar yen because I know we've got a lot of currency traders here. And again, we start to look. It's not about you know me predicting this. I just see you know a trend and it kind of pulls back pretty aggressively and it sells off and it pulls back pretty aggressively and it sells off. And I can kind of come in here and I can start to say, well, is that actually doing a very similar thing each time? It seems to be selling off about the same direction as or about the same amount each time and pulling back a very similar amount. Naturally, that's going to be some kind of fib. So it's very similar to the Apple opportunity where if you spot it and you start to see that, you know, pretty much most of these, most of these pullbacks are going to be coming back to those very similar levels. And you can see here, you've got this low to high swing. You've probably got this one going a little bit deeper at the first bit and it kind of does it again. Now, it's not going to always do it. Um, the key here is really to understand that you've also got supply on the left-hand side, which is what's helping you. But I'm hoping you're kind of starting to see that if you see it once or twice, often you will also get a third leg, uh, which will be the one that you can then say, well, I've seen it twice. It's pulled back to that level twice. I might have supply or demand again or another reason, moving average, as Ty said, or, or potentially even a trend line. This actually has a trend line on it as well. So if you notice... You can grab a trend line tool, pull it through the highs, 
and uh, this is the last one. It pulls back and look at this. It's interesting. So if you pulled this one, you'll say it goes 61.8. And actually initially, can anyone see what it initially does? What's it initially do, Ty? It looks like it initially does sell. You might have been able to break even that trade because you might say, well, that Tom, that's a loser trade. Is it a loser trade? That's gone down quite a lot. Yep. Allowing you, if you were pinpoint entering this this particular position to potentially break even the trade. Okay, you're going to lose the trade, and but are you going to lose money? I mean, no. you are literally, I mean, pipping that thing almost on how close you'd be to entering it if you'd enter that position. You recognize the trend, and as long as you kind of had some kind of break even ruling behind it, there's no real reason for you to lose that. And then you say, "Well, I broke," and then you move on to the next one. But they're going to break eventually, right? They have to. Yeah, of course. So yeah, so like, that's the key: yeah, getting good risk reward trades, um, mm -hmm. and getting as many of them as you can before the inevitable uh, break. Because inevitably, yeah. a, a trend's going to change. As and, I get, and again, I'm not saying you get this one. I'm not even saying you get this one. But this yeah. one, this is good. It's very replicatable. I like that Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So. Look, I think that's probably what we're trying to get through here today, Ty. And uh, hopefully it's been helpful. If you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them right now because uh, we're more than happy to answer those questions. And just a couple of little sequences that I've got there. Obviously, if you're going to trade Fibonacci, supply, demand, support, resistance, any of these types of concepts, I generally find if you're a currency trader, you're going to want to focus that London session and US session. They are the best opens and they often do have these types of retracements in them. It's often considered, isn't it, Ty, that what happens in London is, is sometimes uh, 61.8 retraced or something like that in the US yeah. session and so on and so forth. But yeah, the London session, the US session, uh, they, are, they are really good for this type of stuff. And if you're trading stocks, then of course, you know, the stocks relevant to the session can be, can be incredibly good as well for it or even on higher timeframes. Uh, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about what we do, of course, you can always do that. You can jump on over. I'm going to take our heads away here for a second um, where we talk about you know Fibonacci. We use a lot of fibs in this particular course. Um, you can jump on over to our uh, now called Day Trading Masterclass and it's 25% off for Pepperstone users if you're interested. And that's over on fxevolution.com. Uh, but yeah, Ty, I guess I just wanted to say thank you very much to the community. If you do enjoy it, put the thumbs up. And is there anything else that you wanted to mention that you thought was really good about FIB? I think that um, you've got to keep FIB in context. It's an amazing tool, uh, but in isolation, like many other indicators, it can be very, very pro problematic. If you can use it uh, with other uh, levels, like we've talked about tonight, using it in conjunction with role reversal, supply and demand, trend lines, moving averages, all of those good things that we love to talk about. When they you do get overlap of uh, basically confirmation, the FIB becomes extraordinarily powerful because it is an extraordinarily um, highly used uh, indicator around the world. A lot of people do it, but it's very, very important that you draw the right levels. Don't create them out of nowhere to suit your trading. I think it's probably the best tip we can give you. Don't make a FIB um, you know, up just because you, you think it's at a good level for you. Mm. Make sure that if you can see it, if you called up um, your, your mate, Tom, I'll, I'll put his number on later. If you like, you can call Tom and ask him, does he see that fib? Um, if Tom can't see it uh, and you're the only one that can, that fib is going to have very little relevance. Okay. So when you are drawing your fib lines, just look at it and say, am I the only one seeing this or is this very obvious? Because it's the obvious ones that are going to be the most powerful. Okay. That's very, very important. High to low and low to high. Make sure that you're actually looking at something that is very valid, okay? There's the high to low, so it's pretty valid. It's valid at this point. That's obviously the low, and as it pulls back, you can kind of see it. Make sure it is obvious, as Tyron said. Well, thank you very much from all of us here at Pepperstone and FX Evolution. We hope you enjoyed today's live session, uh, and we will see you, I believe, in two weeks, but I'm hoping to... Get that up to about every week, Ty, so we can continuously follow along with these markets and and get some very great few bits out there. Yeah, we are very, very close. I believe July is the launch date for uh, weekly, so we're, we're going to be coming to you a lot more often. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time. Uh, fire off any questions to Pepperstone Support if you'd like to see anything new uh, or if you have any questions on today's. And, of course, you can watch the replay instantly on the same link uh, if you need a recap on what we've talked about. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. And make sure you read this on the way out. See you for now. Bye.